see what I get for that. So the day earlier than the half day meeting, but it's nice to be here, walking down the light anyway, at uh, 10 to 5 or whatever. Um, this week, well, obviously, the, the, all the information is up there regarding COVID, so you don't need me to repeat it. Just check it out and make sure you're COVID free. But uh, um, the, the services of the week, we, we're actually going to try it on Wednesday evening. It was supposed to be a mission meeting Wednesday evening, but. Um, Afternoon, sorry, well, just about uh, three o'clock. We <laughs> <laughs> were hoping coming here at quarter past seven, though, right? Three o'clock in the afternoon, and um, we, we normally have our prayer meeting and Bible study now at that time. But this week was supposed to be a missionary prayer meeting, and we decided we're going to try and. We, we haven't had a, a Lord's table, we haven't um, had communion for some time. We don't know how it's going to work, so we're going to try it on a Wednesday evening. And so we're going to try it this Wednesday, uh, Wednesday at three o'clock. We're just going to have a prayer meeting and uh, a time around the Lord's table. Uh, if you intend coming, just bring a bit of bread if you're not a loaf. Just, just a little bit of bread and uh, the, the wine will be provided. But if you take your own little bit of bread, then we won't have to dissect and people handle bread and, and so forth. So we're going to try that on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. Then next Lord's Day, um, it'll be myself here in the morning and I'll be here at Godwin. Uh, in the afternoon or the evening also. Um, obviously there are those amongst us who haven't been well. This looks like we've been in, in the war, but I look at some of the people here. Two of them, this is P and um, Della, both broke their wrists or fractured their wrists within 24 hours of each other. Last Friday and Saturday, one on the beach and one on the, on the coastal walk. They went <coughs> together. So um, they, they go through a bit of a, uh, obviously a painful time at the moment. Muriel was out this morning, but um, you know, she hasn't, she hasn't been brilliant really, and it's good to see her this morning. Uh, we also mentioned this morning David's cousin, um, who came down many times in years gone by, who was he broke. He, he and his wife were both taken in for COVID at the same time, and his wife passed away. And she was only probably in her 60s, I would have thought that, you know. So they both went in with COVID. Where were they? Where did they live? Bournemouth. Bournemouth. So um, they both went in, and only one obviously has come out. So. We can remember the family, remember Gareth there and, and his family in, in prayer when we pray shortly. Um, I think that's it, if we can remember those things in prayer. I can ask Brian if you would come and lead us in prayer, if you would invite, please. Thank you, Lord. It changes us from being ordinary, natural people. 
people and the spiritual people. We thank you, Lord. It opens up a new corridor of life altogether, the way that Jesus describes us being the narrow way to life, not the broad way on which most people are treading, which we ourselves once trodden on that way. But thanks to your grace and mercy, Lord, and your love, we are now on that narrow pathway that leads unto life. And so we pray, Lord, for all who have been touched these days by death itself. And all around us are people, in, even in this village, Lord, who have known uh, the touch of death in their lives uh, quite recently. And we pray for them, Lord, that you be the one and the only one able to comfort such people in those circumstances. We do praise you too, Lord, for the way in which you care for us and keep us and provide for us. Uh, there are millions of people in the world tonight, Lord, who have been displaced from their homes because of war, man's greed, and uh, this is the reality, this is the outworking of sin that your Bible tells us so much about. This sin that is the curse of mankind and creates so much trouble, so much uh, anger, so much pain, so much suffering, Lord, and we earnestly thank you this evening that there is a way back to God from those dark paths of sin. And we pray that you help us, Lord, if we're not clear ourselves tonight, we pray that you'll help us to become clear regarding the pathway that leads to life. And so we bless you tonight, Lord, for these things. We pray that you'll continue to help us to listen carefully to your word again this evening, for it may be the very word that we need to hear for our own individual self and situation. We ask these mercies then in Jesus' name.
David and then read the scriptures for us. arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Now the priest answered and said to him, They put the evil under an oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? He answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. Others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ. Who is the one who struck you? Now Peter sat outside the courtyard. And the servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. When you gone out to the gateway, Another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know that man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. And he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Amen. On a Sunday evening, we've been looking at the Gospel of Matthew. We've come to this section that Dave read to us. Now, we're talking this evening about the, the suffering Christ, really. And um, what we're thinking about is the suffering Christ, and then we're going to think about really the, the story of failure and of hope. So, we're going to think of the suffering Christ and the story of failure and of hope. Now, we come to the section where Jesus is coming now. To the, to the cross. This is really the the, the final days, or the final hours, I should say, of his of his life. He approaches the cross. He's going to be put to death. He's going to rise again. He's actually going to ascend and go back to his his rightful place in heaven. And he's going to send his followers into the whole world to preach this good news of the gospel. That's what's going to take take place. And therefore, we find that he's. Come into this position now, which was laid before him. He's already had the Passover feast. He's had the, he celebrated the Last Supper with the with the disciples, and that actually was the the, the last official Passover feast that ever needed to be to be um, put in place because he'd come now to fulfil all the things that had been promised in the Old Testament and had pointed to this this moment when a final sacrifice would be made. And that would be the final atonement sacrifice once and for all for sin. He's had that supper. He's been betrayed, or Judas Iscariot has gone out from the supper to, to betray him. He's gone to the garden of Gethsemane with his, with his followers. He's gone into the garden. He's taken the eleven with him. 
He's left some of the gate. He's gone on further with three of them, three of his closest um, disciples. He says to them, just wait here a while and pray while I go ahead and pray. And he comes back to us to see them. And three times he comes back. And each time the disciples have, have fallen asleep. They're, they're sleeping. And so he comes back somewhat disappointed with them because he'd asked them to watch and to pray. And then he says the third time, well, arise because the one who's going to betray me is, is coming. And Judas Iscariot comes to this, this great entourage of, of soldiers and police from the temple and high priests and so forth. And they would come and they would take him. And, and Peter, later on, Peter will preach a great sermon in the book of Acts, at the beginning of Acts, on the day of Pentecost. And Peter would speak about the suffering saviour there, and what he was saying that these things were ordered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, that was why Jesus came, because he was to be the one who would be the final sacrifice for sin. We sing a hymn which we sang probably in school, there's a green hill far away, outside the city wall, and we say that he died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we may go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. That was really why Jesus came. The crowd has taken him from the garden, they've tied him up, they've taken him away as, as a captive. And we know that the one who came to be the, the saviour was also the king of glory. This was the son of God who came into the world to save sinners. And we find that he Throughout his life, especially in the last three years of his ministry, he proved who he was. His power was manifest. He could, he could perform tremendous miracles. And the people observed that they were looking, many of them, especially the religious leaders, they were looking for a saviour, a deliverer, who would actually release them from the captivity of Rome. That's what they were really after. And we find that in the garden, he comes, and even when, the, when these men come towards him, he displays such power that when he speaks, the whole crowd falls to the ground. And they get up and they're somewhat startled. And then we know what happened. Peter probably felt very courageous at this moment, seeing the power of Jesus. And one of the, one of the servants was there. Peter throws a sword and takes off his ear. Probably ducked and just missed and caught his, caught his ear. And Jesus comes and he, he heals the ear immediately. So they'd seen tremendous things. Even this crowd that was there present that, that particular evening. Oh, but this is the suffering Savior. His suffering is about to begin. And we find that he comes and he's coming to this point now where he's going to be tried. I said the last time I spoke that, that the Jews and the Romans were very proud of their judicial system. They felt that they, they were people of integrity, people who would do things correctly. This trial was going to be going right against all the protocol of the day. They went completely against what, what they would normally do. For a start, you never had a trial in a private location. There was arenas, there were, there were properties and places where they would hold the proper trial. And in fact, he would have six trials that one evening. He would be taken to and fro from one, from the, the former high priest to the present high priest to, the, the, to Pontius Pilate to, to Herod, back to Pontius Pilate, then back to the Sanhedrin and so forth. So they went totally against the protocol of the day with regard to the law. They actually also, and this was totally against Jewish thinking, they actually tried to, to, to get false witnesses to lie against him. And what they were finding was when the witnesses were coming with their, with their false accusations, they were all getting mixed up. And they, they weren't coming out with the truth as it should have been. Verse 61 tells us in this chapter, they actually found two who could agree, as we said this morning. They found two who could agree. And what they agreed on was this. They said that this man said he's going to destroy the temple and within three days he's going to restore it. They marked this temple. And they thought we could. Saying he's going to destroy the temple. We know Jesus primarily was talking about his body, which would die, which would be buried, and he would be raised in three days. So he's now going before the high priest, he's being tried, he's being questioned. In verse 62, there, he gets the, the high priest is getting very frustrated with him. He's saying to him, You actually say nothing, you don't repeat, you don't answer the question that I'm asking you. What he didn't realize was Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 told us that he was going to come as a lamb before his shears, he would be done. He would open not his mouth. So hundreds of years before, 
Isaiah and said, this is what will happen to the night of this suffering lamb who would come and lay down his life. He will not argue the case. Verse 63, he remains silent. And so we find that what actually happens then is that the priests, they want an answer. So they push him, they say, now under oath before God, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Now Leviticus 24 and verse 16 tells us, if you will blaspheme in the name of God, if you are claiming to be God, I should imagine as well, you are actually to be put to death under Jewish law. So once he said, are you the Son of God? Are you the Christ, the Son of God? He knew what was going to happen. And so we find that they thought at last we got him. But back in Luke chapter 4 and verses 17 to 21, if you remember, he did. Got into the synagogue some time before. He picked up the book of Isaiah and when he began to read it and he finished what was read, he put the book down and he said, today this prophecy has been fulfilled in your sight. I'm the man. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Saviour who's promised in the book of Isaiah would come. So it already declared that openly in, in the synagogue. Today the scripture has been fulfilled. I am the one. Remember when he comes into the city that night, or that day before, they, they, were, they, were, they were shouting Hosanna to the son of David. They thought this is the Savior. They knew the great things that he'd done. And he was going to declare that he was the one for whom God said would come and said to his disciples you've seen me, you've seen the Father the Father and I are one in substance, we're equal we're co-equal and so when the high priest pushes him on the road he said you said it I am the Son of God I am the Saviour and he goes on then to quote in, in, from Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 to 14 in and he begins to speak clearly in, in verse 30, he's already said that of chapter 24. He says, I am, I am he, and I will return. One day I will come with all my power, with all the glory, and then you will be under judgment. He makes it very clear. So in verse 65, they basically say, we got you. You blasphemed, now we got you. Now we can actually implement what we want to do. And then, and then we find in verse 65 the high priest was a big show which they were doing those days to show that they were upset. He ripped his own clothes and said, look, I'm, I'm mourning that somebody would dare to claim to be the Son of God and to be God. This is blasphemy. He makes a big show and a big performance in front of everybody. You've heard it yourselves. In verse 66, then what should we do? He's guilty. He must be put to death, came the response. This was the highest court in the land. This was the court that had the authority to do these things, to pass this verdict. And yet they broke so many of their own rules, so much of their own protocol. And from verse 67, 68 there, what actually happens is more rule begins to take over. We find what happens is that the, the Savior would have to endure the things that they would actually do to him. This is the Son of God. This is the Savior of sinners. And then we get a picture of what he knew he'd have to go through. What they begin to do, they spit in his face. And they begin to slap him. And they would pull his beard. And they would do some atrocious things to him. And then they begin to mock him in Luke chapter 22 and verse 64. We, we read in this chapter, they said, oh, who slapped you? Who's doing it? Well, the reason they asked who slapped you was because in Luke, they were told he, they put a, put a cloth around his eyes. He couldn't see. And then they were poking fun and slapping him and saying, now who did that? Come on, you're a prophet. Tell us who did that. You see, they didn't realize that they were actually spitting in the face of God himself. They were treating the Son of God like a criminal. They were there in the presence of the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, who ever only displayed love. The compassion and the love that he displayed over the three years of his ministry. They make the wrong judgment. They carry out the, the punishment the wrong way. They didn't realize this is the savior of sinners who's come into the world. And what they weren't realizing, although he said it, was one day, you must realize I will be judging you. And I will not make mistakes. 
There will be no mistakes when, when you will be judged. There will be nobody discarded who is mine, and there will be no one who thinks they'll get past me who is not. Those who refuse to accept the coming of the Saviour, they will have to endure the judgment of God. And what I can endure now, he could have said, is nothing in comparison to what they will have to endure. See, if a person becomes a Christian, what they say is, in my place condemned he stood. In my place, as my Saviour, he suffered for someone like me. He'd be forsaken even by his own Father. Why? So that we would never ever need to be forsaken by God. So that we could enter into the family of God. How could that ever be? It could only ever be because we've got a suffering Saviour. One who came to be the final Lamb of God. To be offered once and for all to sin. So we need never come under the judgment of God. It's as simple as just putting our faith in Him and acknowledging that He is our Saviour and seeking forgiveness of sins. Because that's why He came, the suffering Saviour. But as you read on in this particular section, we find there is a story of failure. There's also a story of hope. I believe there's hope found for all sinners. There is Forgiveness with God, that's one of the great truths of the scriptures. Whatever we think we've done, and however bad we may have been, I can tell you there's nothing too bad, there's nothing too awful that God cannot cleanse us and forgive us. Why? Because his son took on him the punishment that should have been ours for whatever we've done. He's paid that price. And that's what really this whole section was about. The false accusations, the, the failures of men to act truthfully, the followers of Jesus deserting him, and even he would know the very hand of God upon him. All of this was so that we would have forgiveness of sins available in Jesus Christ. He died once and for all for sin so that we could enter into the family of God. So, in this story, then, there is, there is also this idea that there is failure. We're talking about a follower of God, one who failed. There's also a great story of hope here. Verse 69 to 70. In verse 31, if you remember this chapter, Jesus had said that his followers would desert him. Verse 33 and 35, there's a man who stands up and says, they may leave you, I'm never going to leave you. This is Peter. This is the, the man who is always ready to stand and say his peace and be at the front. They can, I will never leave you. If I had to die, I wouldn't, I wouldn't desert you. But verse 69 to 75 is showing us the story of failure. So we find the disciples in the garden. He's only cut up a year. Jesus healed the year. He said, put up your sword. And then they suddenly realize what's happening. This great crowd. They couldn't be 600 to 1,000 people in the garden, they believe. And suddenly these 11 decide it's time to go. And then they go into the, into the whatever, into the background, into the dark. Now Peter, for all his failings, Peter did actually follow the Lord a little way off from where Jesus was taken. He steps into the courtyard of the high priest where they were going to take this private sit-in in his, in his building there. He gets access to the courtyard. We read in John chapter 18 and verse 15. Someone knew the guard or the, the, the person on the gate. We're led to believe it was the, the Apostle John. And he gives the nod to somebody who allows these two to come in to the, to the courtyard. And verse 34, despite Peter's claim to be absolute loyalty to the end, Jesus had said to him in verse 34, let me tell you, Peter, before this night is out, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And Jesus says clearly, and Peter, we remember, he said, there's no way I will deny you. But Peter, you should have been awake when you were sleeping. Peter, you should have been listening to my words and you should have been praying. Verse 58. Peter couldn't stay away. He loved his Savior. He followed the Lord for three years. He'd given up his whole occupation to follow him. But now this was a man who, despite his great power and strength of character, he was a man who was afraid. He's in the courtyard, surrounded by the temple guards. God's trying to keep his head down, 
keep a low profile, just see what they're actually going to do with this road. He had taken no notice of what Jesus had said about the fact that he would desert and he would leave him. Probably they had a fire warming himself in the, in the courtyard with those who were there. And he's warming himself, in, in one sense he's put himself right in the hot spot figure of Gary. He's there amongst people where he shouldn't have been. And one of the things that people tell us is that we can't really rely on the Bible. But if ever you come across these sort of incidents in the Bible, it should cause us to remember this. If this was false, if this is just a story that's made up, if you want to build for the future, you want to have a foundation where you can say, here is where we come from, these great apostles, and these great men of God. And how they were marvelous, they, they were walking around with, you know, halos and what have you. Know, the Bible doesn't paint that picture. The Bible paints us exactly as things are. We were told of people with their warts and all. So if you were just telling a pack of lies and fabricating the story, and you wanted to build something for the future, you'd be making sure you didn't tell these sort of things, that one of the great leaders betrayed his master. But this is the foundation upon which scripture is, is held, it's infallible, it's without error, it's inspired of God. So we find this man is, we get the picture of what he's really like. He was brash, he was confident, he was full of himself, but he's in the courtyard of Caiaphas the priest, and a little servant girl comes over to him. And she just says to him, Are you not one of the disciples of Jesus of Galilee? Mark's disciple, Mark's um, reference actually adds that a little bit. You are Jesus Christ of Nazareth of Galilee. Are you one of his followers? And once she mentioned Nazareth Galilee, that was a little bit like saying, you know, you came from a ghetto in, in New York or something. You come from the, the pits of a place. And nobody any, ever, ever comes out of that place, Nazareth of Galilee. That's the lowest of low. So when in Mark's gospel it says, are you one of the followers of Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee? That's what she's saying. Verse 70, Peter plays a little dumb. It's the first time he's going to deny Jesus. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I have a clue what you're on about. This is Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 71, having been confronted by a young girl, he now heads for the gate. He wants to give a wide berth to this girl and to the situation. But he still can't go totally away. So we find that he goes. But Peter, who had seen firsthand the power of Jesus, who had the greatest preacher ever to walk this planet, was in the presence of the Son of God for three years, and he's already denied his Savior to a young girl. He's the one who said, but you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had no doubts who Jesus was. This is Peter who earlier took up that sword and took up the, the year of that man. But the Bible tells us this as Christians. Take heed that you who think you stand, unless you fall. We can be very bigoted and we can say, well, you see, there's no way I'll back out of being a Christian. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to say my piece and, and so forth. Well, we're totally careful because we can all fail and we can all fall. And we can sometimes fall at the smallest and the most unlikeliest of hurdles that come against us. In verse 71, he's slipping away a little further. And then we find that another girl, a young girl, comes and she's seen him there and she begins to speak to him. And she says to people who are around, you know, this man here, he was also with Jesus of Nazareth. This time, verse 72, he denies him again for the second time. He doesn't just deny him. He swears with an oath. And the oath there isn't like cursing. The oath here is to say, I swear by Almighty God I do not know this man. Before all those people who were listening, he was being adamant. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this man. I swear by Almighty God. You see, P Peter, like us, Despite all he knew, despite the confidence he had in himself, he was vulnerable, just like we are. He was liable to fail, and he was liable to fall. And despite all his privileges, despite all the things that he'd known over the last three years, 
we find that he fails. I wonder how often we fail to align ourselves with Jesus if we're Christians tonight. I wonder how often we'd be very embarrassed to tell people we were in church Sunday night. Or we gather with people to pray or we read our Bible. I wonder if we'd be embarrassed to actually say those sort of things. Peter's still around. He, he hasn't left yet. Verse 73. He must have entered into conversation with some of the people who were around about him. And what happened was, once they began to talk to him, they begin to pick up his accent. Now, if you went to England, and you're from Pembrokeshire, born and bred, they will say to you, you're from Wales. You've got a Welsh accent, haven't you? Now, if you go, you, you listen to people from Pembrokeshire, you're willing to get a Welsh accent. But if you go to, if you go to England, they will pick up straight away, well, people actually from Welsh Ireland as well. <laughs> but they will pick up the fact that you've got a Welsh accent. If you were talking to someone from Carmarthenshire and you were from Pembrokeshire all your life and you're broad Pembroke, they would say to you, you're from down below, aren't you? you, you you're, you're, you're Pembroke. Because we don't sound Welsh, most of us. We've got this broad Pembrokeshire accent, which is a strange accent. And they would pick up straight away, we're not, we are maybe Welsh, but we're Pembrokeshire Welsh. And so these people, they would listen to what, what Peter had to say. And they picked up again that his accent was such. You've got a Galilean accent, they said. And we find again that Peter, verse 74, Peter now strongly denies that he knows Jesus as his friend. He does so with cursing, maybe with, with oaths again, saying before God, I swear I am not part of this man. Follow it. And with all that Jesus had to endure and all the pain and the suffering that he was going through, he's got one of his closest allies disassociating himself with him. Even using God's name in vain to vindicate his position. See, how low could he stoop? How low could he go? How quickly sin entered in? How one line becomes a second line, becomes a third line. And we have to cover up, don't we, when we start to, to lie. We have to be very good at lying if we're going to be lying. Verse 74. Remember what Jesus said. He reminded me three times before the cock crows, before the dawn breaks. And suddenly it happens. Peter must have been able to see Jesus because in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22 and verse 61, we find that Jesus looks over Close enough to observe the through a window or what have you, he was able to observe Peter. That look when Jesus turned and looked upon the apostle. That look must have left a lasting mark on the apostle Peter. <coughs> that face which was bleeding, that face which had been beaten, which had been spat upon, was the face that now looked upon this man. Verse 75. What happens is he remembers the words of Jesus. To listen to God's word and not to take note of it is a foolish position to be in. James chapter 1 and verses 22 to 24 tells us it's a bit like reading the Bible. It's a bit like looking in a mirror. And when you look in the mirror and you see that you, if you're, you're a lady, your lipstick's up here somewhere or your eye if you're a lady, you, your eye makeup's down here. I don't know the guys they wear it, but if you if you if you've got eye makeup on and you see the smudge and you look in the mirror, you say, oh, that's it. And you walk away and go outside. Well you'd be a bit foolish, wouldn't you? Because you'd want to sort that out. Someone who looks into the Bible, listens to God's word, understands what God is saying, turns away as if it didn't mean anything to him. It's like such a person who looks in the mirror and doesn't address the issue. In other words, not to take on board the words of Jesus is absolute foolishness. And for the Christian, not to take notice of what God is saying through his word is the beginning of a downward slope. It's the beginning of sliding back. We need certain things in our Christian walk to be able to keep going. And as you read the book of Acts, it tells us right at the beginning what the church needed to do. They needed to meet together. It says we need fellowship. We're not, you know, we're not one on our own. 
We need to remember the Lord's table, which we'll do, God willing, this Wednesday. We need to be those who pray together. We need to pray at home. We need to pray together. We, we need to be those who are studying the Word of God, the Apostles' Doctrine, and so forth. We need to be those who are sharing the things that we've got with the, with the work of God. Remember, Peter failed in the garden. He wasn't watching. He wasn't praying. Peter failed when Jesus told him what would take place. He listened to the words of Jesus, but he never took it on board. He found himself amongst those that he should not have been amongst. He was amongst the, they, they were, you can imagine, rough and ready soldiers, police from the temple and so forth. Psalm 1 and verse 1 tells us to be very wise who we share company with. To be very wise who you sit with, who you deal with. Because they have an impact upon our lives, whether we realize it or not. Those that we get close to, they, they impact our lives. So Psalm 1 and verse 1 says, you see, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So his company has a, an impact upon our lives. Peter there failed to recognize initially what Jesus had said. And really, it's a story of failure. And perhaps we've never put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the story of failure, isn't it? We do. Maybe we have put our faith in Him and we're beginning to wander away and become cold and slipping away. That's the story of failure. It's not the way it should be. If we left it there, that's quite a sad way to end the evening. But we've got a story of hope here as well. You see, unlike Judas Iscariot, who got his 30 pieces of silver, suddenly realized what he'd done and threw it on the, on the floor before the, the priest didn't want it anymore. He goes out and he's just totally disoriented, he doesn't know what to do and in the end he goes and hangs himself. Verse 75, Peter was terribly sorry what he'd done, didn't hang himself. He went out and he wept bitterly, it says. He went out and he opened his heart before God. He wept, but you know what, he found forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the story of hope. Remember back in Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. Our Lord said this about Peter. He said, listen Peter, Satan has desired to have you, but I have prayed for you, that your faith will fail not. Now I'm greatly encouraged, I've got people I know who prayed for me for many, many years. For many years. And I'm encouraged when I think that people pray for me. What a great encouragement to know that Jesus prays for his children, for his people, for his followers. Satan wants to have you, Peter. Listen, Peter, you're all right. You failed, but I've prayed for you. Now, we're all going to fail at some time or other. We're going to be like Peter. We may have even done things we should never have done, like David, commit adultery, whatever. We may all have done silly things. Yet, David. Peter, they didn't continue in their sin. Peter was sorrowful. He repented. We are weak, but he is strong. And as much as Peter was pained with what he'd done, how much more the Lord must have been pained to look on. The Bible tells me this for the Christian. Or the song tells us this actually. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he's strong. He prays for his children. He keeps his people. We come across a lot of things, and I'll finish with this, come across a lot of things which are tradition and just passed down through the years. One of the traditions says this about Peter. I have no idea what it's like. But it said that Peter, whenever he heard a cock crow, tears ran down his eyes because it brought to remembrance that night in his day the night of the story of his failure verse 75 Peter remembered Jesus' words he went out and he wept bitterly Peter realised he'd sinned against the Saviour 
John chapter 21, after Jesus had raised from the, been raised from the dead, he comes to Peter. Three times he said to Peter, didn't say remember when he was letting me down street, he says, three times, do you love me, Peter? Do you love, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Every time he says, Peter, I've got work for you to do. Go and feed my sheep. You see, there's hope for repentant and sorrowful sinners, which we're all sinners, but for sorrowful and repentant, like Peter was, there's great hope. God can restore the fallen and the failed. There's hope for us all. There's hope for us all because Peter became a man who was greatly used of God. You remember at the resurrection, he tells, he's going to tell the disciples, I'm Peter. Highlights Peter as being the one who wants to be told that he's raised from the dead. He wrote two epistles, 2 Peter, two Peter chapter 3, and verse 17 and 18 read like this. Remember who's writing this? Peter. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of wickedness, and with growing grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. That's the note Peter finished his life on. He was a suffering Saviour, he had to suffer. It was a story of a failure, and I think we can open our hands up tonight and say we're failures very often. But also a story of hope, because he forgives sinners. We're thankful that Peter failed, but Jesus never let him go. We're going to listen to him now that reminds us of that great truth. O oh, love that will not let me go.
And when we fall, we will be quick to come back to you to seek forgiveness. And then we'll seek to follow hard after you. So help us, we pray, because we step out into a world that is often contrary to the Christian message. So we ask for grace and strength to be able to walk through this week and to hold our heads high as those who follow you. Go with us and keep us, we ask in your name. Amen.